All right, guys, where we stopped yesterday was King Darius of Persia had come over to the Greek colonies to attack them for setting up camp in his land and not paying him taxes. This will lead to him destroying the colonies and starting the long Persian wars within ancient Greece. And he brings his army over um, north of Athens, um, close to the town of Marathon. And he asks the Greeks for symbols of surrender, both earth and water, symbolically giving his land, their land, and their life-giving water to him. Well, the Greeks, the Athenians, excuse me, will ask the Spartans for help. And the Spartans at first refuse, but they relent and say, when our high religious festival is done, we will be there. As um, soon as it's over, we'll come as quick and as we can. Well, the Athenians are like, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. This thing's going to be over before you get there. And Darius lands at Marathon, uh, you know, about 26 miles or so north of Athens, and a battle ensues. And there is a vote just before the battle of should the Athenians surrender or should they fight? The Athenians and the tiny little city-state of, of, of Plataea decided to, to join, join together and do battle. And by one vote, the Greeks decide to assault King Darius, who they were hoping was going to make some, time, some type of mistake and they could capitalize on it. Well, he does. And the Battle of Marathon is a decisive Athenian victory. They come out of the hills surrounding Marathon. Their phalanxes crash into um, King Darius, and they quickly gobble him up and kill most of his men. His young son Xerxes led a heroic cavalry charge that saved some people, while Darius bailed and left his men on the beach to go back home to Persia. And the Greeks are excited. They've just won a total, uh, you know, um, dark horse victory, this, this, this upset. It was like the 1980 U.S. Olympic hockey team defeating the um, Russians. This is incredible. And so they send their fastest runner to tell the people of Athens who were getting ready to um, evacuate, rejoice, we have conquered. And his name is Pheidippides. And legend has it that the goddess Nike came down and put her wings on the back of his heels and propelled him to the city where he yells out, Rejoice, we have conquered, and falls down stone cold dead. He's dead. Um, but the Athenians have won, and they throw a big giant party. And in the middle of the party, the Spartans come running in. And the Athenians make fun of them. Oh, you're big, rough, tough Spartans. You guys were here, you know, supposed to be ready to, to do battle. And when the chips are down, you guys are late. You have your religious festival that you have to undertake. Um, while the Spartans were insulted, insulted by the treatment they get at the Athenians, sorry, I'm a little rattled. We just got some numbers in the faculty meeting that has my brain in a totally different place. I'll tell you guys about it in class. So when you see, you'll see this, you're like, wow, that's why he's so, he's so weird. The um, Spartans are insulted at their treatment by the Athenians. And what no one knew is there was a landslide that blocked the main road between Athens and Sparta. And so the Spartans had marched pretty much for two days overland to get there to back up their Athenian allies. They honored their word. Instead of respecting that, the Athenians make fun of them. So the Spartans go home. And so for the next several years, um, things are quiet. Back home in Persia, King Darius will be assassinated on the way to his daughter's wedding. And the guys that assassinated him turn to his young son Xerxes, who didn't abandon them, and they make him their new king. And Xerxes has two objectives. Number one, to secure the western borders of his empire, which means he's got to do something about Greece. And on the other hand, he's got to avenge his father's loss. So he begins to build this enormous multicultural army to invade Greece with. Well, over in Athens, 
Uh, one of the city fathers, a guy named Themistocles, convinces the Athenians to build a shipping fleet that was part, partially to be used for trading and part for war. So we defeated Persia once, but they're going to come back. Lo and behold, ten years or so later, it is true. And Xerxes is coming to conquer all of Greece. This time, after asking the Spartans for help several times, the Spartans relent and their famous king Leonidas, or Leonidas, takes 300 Spartans up here to Thermopylae, this narrow mountain pass way north of Athens, where the great battle of King Leonidas and the 300 Spartans are fought, slowing down the mighty Persian army. They don't win, 298 of them are killed, but they slowed Xerxes down in time for Athens to be evacuated. And Themistocles will evacuate the population and take them to the tiny little island of Salamis, off the coast of Athens, the treacherous harbor uh, of Athens. And there he hides most of his warships behind the island, and he stakes a few out as bait. And Xerxes comes in, and he says, we're going to kill and capture all the Athenian men. We're going to enslave the women and the children. He puts his big lumbering barges out there that can't turn. They're, they're very um, poorly made. They're just big enough to float. And those ships that Themistocles had made crashes into them, sinking many of them. And the mighty Persian army is defeated. Um, Admiral Chester Nimitz will use the same plan um, in World War II to help kind of plan the Battle of Midway. Lure the enemy in and then hammer them. Hide behind the island and unleash your surprise. And just like that, the mighty Persian army is defeated. The Greeks have won. And this is an enormous moment in world history as Greece and democracy is about to be born. The world's first democracy will happen right here at this point. Xerxes was so convinced of victory, he had his throne chair brought to the seacoast so he could watch the destruction of Athens, and he was completely wrong. His men looted Athens, they burned Athens, and they trashed it, but they were forced to flee. Xerxes, like his dad, heads home, and his army has to try to march back to the Persian Empire, where they're surrounded in the tiny city-state of Plataea and destroyed. And a lot of this was done by this guy right here named Pericles, the great Athenian statesman Pericles. And the defeat of Persia ushers in the great Greek empire, featuring the two great city-states, Athens and Sparta. Sparta was asked to be the leader of ancient Rome, or of ancient Greece, but they said, no, we've done our bit, we fought, now we're just going to go home. So Athens becomes the de facto leader, and the golden age of democracy is created as this beautiful representation of Athens with a 40-foot-tall statue of Athena will be present. And um, after the Persian Wars, Greece is going to thrive under Pericles. He's going to lead for about, you know, about 30 years. And he was a general and a statesman, and he brings the concept of direct democracy to Athens, where every man has a vote, and we're going to go to the assembly, and we're going to know the outcome of the vote immediately. We're going to know who voted yes, who voted no, and whatever side wins. So you've got to be accountable for your yes or your no vote. We know the, the, the outcome. And the Greeks believed that you had to really participate in government. If you live here, you have to want it. And that a citizen that doesn't pay attention to the day-to-day -day operations of their city-state, who isn't involved, isn't harmless, but instead useless. You've got to want it to live here. And after this time, Athens grows in wealth and power and prestige. Money pours in from, from trade, and um, Pericles will use all of this money to rebuild a bigger, brighter, more, more powerful city-state of Athens. 
And because they were afraid of Persia coming back one more time, a lot of the Greek city-states developed a thing known as the Delian League, a defensive alliance that if Persia attacks any single one of them, the rest will come join in and help. There were two ways to join. You paid money into a treasury on the neutral island of Delos, or you provide ships and weapons. Well, Athens provided the bulk of the ships and the weapons, and over time they get bigger and bigger and bigger and stronger and stronger and stronger, um, that Pericles felt, why are we spending our own money rebuilding Athens that the Persians destroyed? We're going to go and take that protection money from Delos, we're going to move it to Athens, and we're going to use everybody else's money to rebuild our city. And over time, the other city-states said, well, wait a minute, we don't think Persia's coming back. We really don't think that it's worth keeping the alliance anymore because, well, we don't need it. And Athens said, oh, no, 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 no. Once you join, you join for life. It's kind of like the mafia. Once you're in, you're in. There's no backing out. And those that threatened to, um, you know, pull out from the uh, treaty, from the defensive alliance, Athens threatened to invade them. They were bullying them exactly the way Darius had bullied their colonies years um, before. In actuality, Persians didn't really bully them. The Greeks caused the whole problem, but different story for a different time. Because of the power that Athens was getting, down in the southern part of Greece, Sparta began to form its own defensive alliance. Athens is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, stronger and stronger and stronger. What if they try and take over all of Greece? So they instead form a different defensive alliance known as the Peloponnesian League. That if any Delian League city-state attacks us, the rest will jump in and help. But it's defensive only. We can't start the war. And so, eventually, a war is going to take place. Um, it's you know, only a matter of time before the two big boys square off. And in 431 BC, Athens and Sparta go to war. And there's some, you know, battles in and around the countryside. And eventually, Sparta surrounds Athens. But Athens had built a defensive wall from the Acropolis all the way to the seaport. So they can still get supplies in, but they're siege, neither army gaining an advantage. Well, every Athenian had to move into the city. And after a while, the overcrowding causes a problem. A plague breaks out. And it kills one-third of the population of Athens, including Pericles. And for the last 30 years, Pericles had done everything. Right? How do we make sure there's enough food? Well, don't worry about it. Pericles will take care of it. Are the crops you know, you know, growing? Is the irrigation good? I don't worry about it. Pericles will take care of it. Um, is the army training? Yeah, 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 yeah. Pericles has got it. And now that Pericles is gone, nobody knows what to do. He had always done everything. But now, the leadership of Athens becomes divided. Rather than focus on the Spartans who were outside the door, many guys in Athens begin to fight over, well, who is going to replace Pericles? Who's going to take over for him? And Socrates is saying, guys, why are you worrying about that when the Spartans are outside knocking on the gosh darn door? During this time, Sparta is able to go over and get a key ally in Persia. Hey, Persia, how would you like to get back at Athens for what they did to you at Salamis? If you blockade their port at Piraeus, we'll be able to defeat them and we'll let you guys loot the city. Persia is only too happy to help the vaunted Spartans. They come over, and Athens is forced to surrender. And once again, Persia destroys the beautiful city of Athens, and they take the 40-foot-tall golden statue of Athena, the one that Percy and Annabeth are eventually going to rescue from underneath the Colosseum. 
And so um, I like to say during this period, the Peloponnesian War, Greece was split into two camps. An interesting parallel is the victorious allies after World War II, part of which went under the North Atlantic, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, a defensive alliance led by the United States against the encroachment of communism, and the Warsaw Pact led by the Soviet Union to protect itself and satellite countries from encroachment um, by the Western capitalist democracies. NATO and the Warsaw Pact was like the Delian and Peloponnesian League um, round two. So during this time um, of the Peloponnesian War, there's a period of art and beauty in ancient Greece. When the city was rebuilt, the best artists and sculptors from the ancient world were um, brought in. And the Greeks like simple, idealistic beauty. Here is a picture of the Discobolus, where no matter if you were short or tall or fat or skinny, you were sculpted in your best possible light, um, that you had no imperfections. And the Greeks weren't very gaudy. They liked simple, idealistic beauty, kind of like what I talked about with Crazy Christmas Light Man down on 86 here in town or like a, a home during the holidays where they just had a, a, you know, a wreath and a candle in the window. Simple, elegant, idealistic beauty. Hang on here, my, my uh, camera is leaning. And so the Greeks build the Parthenon. It's not real big, um, but with the curved roof and the um, unique um, architecture, um, with the columns that, that flare and taper, the light makes it look bigger and brighter than it really is. Simple yet beautiful. That is what Greek art and architecture was like. And because of the way they reacted towards Sparta after Marathon, and the way things went with the Persian Wars, the Greeks began to warn against something known as hubris, or excessive pride. They began to warn against getting cocky. So they began to put it in the social media of the day, their plays. And so the ancient Greeks will create the tragedy, a story that is written in three parts, where the hero is going to do a great deed and become famous, in the second act, they're going to get cocky, they're going to get all full of themselves, and they're going to make a tragic mistake. And part three will be the tragic consequences to that mistake. This is the result. Like Theseus' dad jumping off the cliff after he forgot to take down these sails. This is what we're going to remind you. We're going to put it right in front of you and make you think about it so you don't get too big for your bridges. Unfortunately, as we know, for the people of Athens, they didn't really listen as they were defeated by Sparta and Persia. The father of the tragedy, so why we get the frowning mask here, symbol of the theater, is a guy named Aeschylus who came up with the blueprint um, for this. Um, our favorite guy is Euripides. Remember Euripides' pants? It's going to be a tragedy. Um, Euripides championed the rights of slaves and women. Why are we mistreating these two groups in society? And the greatest of all is a guy named Sophocles. Sophocles, some of you have read um, uh, with Miss Jones. Um, you know, he's the author of Oedipus Rex. Those of you who haven't read it yet, you will. Um, Sophocles is considered the greatest. He writes 123 plays. Unfortunately, only seven of which have survived. So. That's great, but after a while, people are like, oh my God, this is so boring, so depressing. Can we have something good? And so here is um, Theseus and the Minotaur. Other writings at this time are Aesop's fables, like the grasshopper and the ant. Come, man, let's go and play. And the ant says, no, it's getting colder. We've got to get ready for winter. And the grasshopper says, oh, don't worry about it. We'll do it tomorrow. And then when winter comes, the poor grasshopper freezes while the ant is warm and snug in their little den. But that stuff is depressing. And finally, a guy named Aristophanes comes up with the idea of the comedy. 
It's where we get the smiling mask uh, to balance the frowning mask as symbols of the theater. And Aristophanes used satire like comedy, like Saturday Night Live, to make fun of politicians. Because just by the act of being a politician and making a decision, you're going to make a certain portion of the population of the city-state angry. You can't please everybody. And so politicians hated Aristophanes, but they saw how much the people loved it. So pretty soon, Aristophanes goes from a guy who was hated and, and, and disliked to he got the best seats at the restaurants and got invited to all the A-list parties. And it was soon seen that if Aristophanes wasn't making fun of you, you weren't doing your job. A little bit more art and culture and education in ancient Greece. This is also the time of the three great philosophers, Socrates, who came up with his questioning method. He was killed right after the death of Pericles because he was saying, why are you fighting over who's going to be the next Pericles when the Spartans are outside the door? All right, know thy, thyself. I'm a city father, excuse me, but I really don't like democracy because you guys... You know, you can't make a decision for yourself. How can you choose for me? This is when Plato goes and looks for the world's perfect government that he supposedly finds in Athens, where he says, hey, um, you know, you should subordinate yourself to the will of the community. Do what the community wants you to, not what you want to. And last but not least is Aristotle who said, moderation in all things. In politics, if you want to win, aim for the middle class and encourage your citizens to be the best that they possibly can be. Give them a goal and help them to achieve it. And Pericles says, a man who does not participate in the polis isn't harmless but useless. All these things are going on in this great golden age of Athens. When it comes to history, we have the writer Herodotus who writes the history of the Persian Wars. The only problem with Herodotus is um, a lot of the stuff he made is fiction um, at worst, historical fiction at best. Um, what he couldn't write or prove or corroborate with evidence, he just filled in the gaps himself and just made it up. He was countered by a guy named Thucydides who wrote the history of the Peloponnesian Wars. And Thucydides interviewed Athenians, and he interviewed Spartans, and he interviewed Persians. And if he could not prove it, he didn't write it. So Thucydides is much more factual than um, Herodotus. And after the Peloponnesian Wars, the Greeks were very weakened. And on their way back home, Sparta was attacked by another city-state of Thebes. And they were extremely weak. And fighting in the Peloponnesian Wars as an ally of Sparta was a war leader um, named Philip. And Philip was from uh, cousins, ethnic cousins of the Greeks up in Macedonia. And in prison, he began to learn and love and respect Greek culture. And he said, I have to save them from themselves. So he conquers and attacks Greece to prevent them from destroying themselves. And Philip has a young son named Alexander. And the two of them conquer the Greeks in 338 BC at a place called Sharona. Ma, 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 my Sharona. And after the battle, um, Philip um, was on the way to his daughter's wedding, very similar to King Darius, and he was assassinated. And young Alexander the Great becomes king. Now as a boy, Alexander the Great was tutored by Aristotle of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. When he was young, his dad brought Aristotle back with him when he got out of prison and said, teach my son. And Aristotle taught Alexander to be inquisitive, to love everything, but he also taught him to really dislike that mean Persian empire who destroyed Athens not once, but twice. And so at the age of, of 20, Alexander leads his army in a conquest of Persia. 
And he goes over to Turkey and wins some quick victories. Then he goes down to Egypt to secure food for himself, you know, and, and nice supply lines. And there he goes to an oracle and finds out that he is a demigod. He is a descendant of Hercules himself. And he gets his men all whipped up into it, and they conquer um, not only Turkey, but Egypt. And they go deep into the Middle East, and they get to the Euphrates River, and the Persian emperor Darius comes out and says, Oh, great mighty Alexander, every battle we have fought, you've won, so why don't we split the empire? You take everything from the Euphrates River westward, and I'll take from the Euphrates eastward. And to show my good faith, I'll... You can choose one of my daughters to marry to cement this relationship. And Alexander says, well, why would we take half the empire and one of your daughters when I can kill you and have it all? And so eventually, Alexander in 331 conquers Babylon, and he keeps going across Asia all the way to the Indus River Valley. Whereas men say, oh, man, this has been great, but dude, we've marched. 11,000 miles in 10 years. We just want to go home. Knowing that his men, without his hardcore Macedonian supporters, Alexander was done, he decides to return to Babylon to resupply and refit. And while he's there, the young Alexander is going to die. At this point, he had the world's largest empire the world had ever known to this point. He had never lost a single battle. He was undefeated and untied. And as he conquered, he renamed several cities Alexandria. And it was kind of um, sad. But what he does is he creates a new type of culture called Hellenistic culture, a combination of Greek of Egyptian, of Persian, and Indian learning. It was a giant melting pot of everything, religion, culture. And as Alexander conquered, he took with him, remember, he was tutored by Aristotle, zoologists, botanists, linguists. They wrote languages down, plant and animal and soil samples. They learned math, and they took all of this knowledge back and Alexandria, or Alexander, who eventually marries a Persian woman and adopts, you know, Persian dress, will build a great museum in the city on the Egyptian coast that he founds called Alexandria. And in it, he builds the House of Muses for the famed um, nine Greek goddesses of learning. And the House of Muses has a lecture hall. It has laboratories, it had a zoo, it had botanical gardens, and a giant library that contained 300 scrolls of ancient learning. Just about everything that was known in the ancient world. And anybody who was anybody could come there to freely study, to learn what Alexander had accumulated. Some of the people that will um, study there um, was Aristarchus, who figured out that there was the heliocentric theory that the earth revolves around the sun. Eurasthenes calculated the circumference of the earth at its widest point at the equator within a few hundred miles. And Archimedes will figure out practical inventions like the lever and the pulley. Um, simple machines, the in-kind plane, the lever. He says, give me a firm enough place to stand and a long enough lever, and I can move the world. Um, Pythagoras will write up the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, the, the sides of the right triangle. And Euclid will take a look at all of the known works of geometry and compile them into a step-by-step -step book he called The Elements. All of these guys learn and teach at the House of Muses. And while that's going on, Hippocrates, a Greek doctor, will start a medical school. And at his medical school, uh, he will teach both men and women, and he will make them take an oath to promise not to hurt, harm, or endanger any of their patients. 
They're not for experimentation. You are to heal them. And they looked for medicines and herbs that would cure sicknesses and illness. And they tried to figure out the causes and do surgery. And so um, now today's, you know, your parents who are, you know, doctors, nurses, dentists, um, psychologists have to take the Hippocratic Oath. It comes from this period. Well, ancient Greece gives us a lot of ideas on science and math and art and engineering, culture, law, and education. And they set the foundation for Western civilization. But at this time during the Hellenistic period, another empire emerges, the powerful empire of Rome, who is going to meld Greek and Roman learning to, that will impact um, Western civilization for years to come. All right, guys, you're going to take a test on this soon. Um, please listen to this. I hope it's nice and easy for you. Um, this is as fast as I could possibly do Greece. So enjoy.